what's shaking, everybody? Welcome to House Divided here on Orange Bloods Live. It's a Thursday, which means it's a war room night over at orangebloods.com. But for now, it's me, Jeff Ketchum. It's him, Chad Hastings. We're going to be with you for the next hour plus. John Harris from the Houston Texans will join us at 1215. We'll profile uh, his thoughts on the NFL draft. We'll get his reaction to Stefan Diggs joining the Texans. Just seemed like a good day to have Mr. Harris on the show. Looking forward to that. Chad, just so you know, I sent him a link early. He's good to go. Nice. We'll get to 1215 and it won't be like, did Jeff send him the thing that he was supposed to send him? I think we're good to go. Guys, do us a solid. Hit that thumbs up button. Slam the like button. Subscribe to the channel. Get notification. All those things. And we do appreciate Blake and ATX Big Rich and everybody jumping into the Specs chat today on a Thursday. Uh, it was practice day over on the 40 acres. Yet another practice uh, as they head towards the spring game on April 20th. Today may have been known more for Travis Scott showing up today at Texas <laughs> practice. And it seems like we're getting more video of Travis Scott at practice than we've ever got a video from practice, which is a strange thing. Maybe I need to employ Travis Scott to just go over to the 40 acres and distract them while we scoop up practice notes moving forward. I don't know. It's, it doesn't seem like the worst thing in the world today. Uh, talking a little Arch Manning today as well, Chad. Um, we're now officially beyond the midway point in practices for the spring. It's been kind of a, a more quiet spring on the Arch Manning front than I might have guessed a month ago, uh, but it's definitely not a bad thing. It, I, I think it speaks to getting to work, doing work, uh, and you're probably not talking about a player uh, that's looking to, you know, trend on Twitter or anything like that while he's putting his work in. Uh, but we'll have some stuff on Arch Manning tonight in the war room, and I thought it would be a good place to start today talking about it here on the show. Yeah, no, I think it's a, a great place to start. By the way, Ryan jumps in the chat and just throws in an OU sucks. And, uh, and that is good. Uh, and we do have, uh, just to just to check here, Ethos is saying, I don't think you're live on YouTube. Okay, we think we are. Let's double check that. Let's double check. I, I think we hit the buttons that needed to be hit. Can we double check? I'm going to double check for you, Chad. All right, you double check right now. Peyton's throwing hook em horns emojis. I'm assuming I that see us live. We're good. Beautiful. All right, cool. Ethos, thank you for double checking us, though. Um Catch, I do think it is – it's an interesting discussion, and I agree with you that it has been a little more quiet than we thought. We've talked about it. This is a circus unlike anything we've ever seen, ever. Even even the at the University of Texas, it's unique when you're talking about Arch Manning, backing up Quinn Ewers, going to the SEC, just all the ingredients of this circus. But first off, before we get to Arch, I think attaboy number three is probably deserved because you know that if – 10 more balls had hit the ground because of Quinn Ewers than Arch Manning. You'd have heard about it. Other guys at OB would have heard about it, and we would have already talked about it. So attaboy to the starter for stepping up and being the clear starter, and now we can get to Arch. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's really interesting, uh, it's a good segue. I, I, I spoke with somebody yesterday about this very topic, and – Quinn and Arch together, but you know, Quinn's performing at a level in camp that's not opening the door for Arch Mania to take over. And we know that if there wasn't an, an opening, that the mob, the hype mob, would do exactly that. So Quinn Ewers having a really good camp. Spoke with somebody yesterday about Arch, and the sense was he's having a good camp. He's got a much more of a mastery of the offense than he had a year ago. I, I think that the next step for him in the evolution of a, as him as a quarterback is maybe to be a little more daring, that he's taking care of the football. He's running the offense effectively to such an extent that when people talk about Arch, they'll say things like, it's going to be a smooth transition the day that he does have to replace Quinn Ewers, if they needed him uh, to come in either in a real short term or even for a couple of games, there's a sense that the offense 
wouldn't need to change much. There is a sense, though, that like a lot of young quarterbacks, he still needs to get to the point where pushing the ball down the field while not trying to push the ball down the field, if, if that makes sense. Push the ball down the field, being a little more daring, but not going out there with the objective of today is the day I'm going to be more daring. I'm going to throw the ball down the field. I, I think that there's just a natural evolution that's the next step for him as part of this evolution as a quarterback. And I think it's one of the things that most young quarterbacks go through. Right? How do you go from being – the check down king to somebody who's able to attack all areas all the time. It's taken Quinn Ewers a while to get there. I think there's a sense that Arch Manning is further ahead at the same exact time in his career than Quinn was. But again, I think that this is the part with the weapons that they have. I think being a more effective down the field thrower is is the thing that's a continued work in practice. But they love the fact that he takes care of the ball. He knows what he's doing. He knows what the other guys are supposed to do. Uh, his bad plays are really limited for uh, a young player. Like he's just not mistake prone. And now you want to see that that evolution where he can be aggressive without being aggressive. That it's just natural. It's a part of the offense as opposed to a thing he's trying to do. Uh, but everybody seems really happy about the quarterbacks in general. Everybody's really happy with what they've seen from Quinn Ewers in camp. It's funny, you don't hear the leadership thing as much about Arch as you do from Quinn Ewers, which makes a lot of sense because one's the starter and one isn't. But they're definitely it, – it, it feels like when you talk to people who are in and around the team – that it's become a more natural thing for Quinn to do. Whereas I think in the last couple of years, it felt like he was trying to be a leader and now he's just a leader. It, for both of these quarterbacks, the things that they're working on, it's not try, it's just do. It's not, you know, it is, it's existing inside of your skin comfortably enough that you can do all of those things without it feeling like you're trying to do those things. And for each guy, they've got their own little set of areas that they're working on. I think the leadership thing for Quinn is a big one. And you hear people say he's more vocal. He's more comfortable in his skin. And that these things are just happening organically. And I, I would assume that in 12 months' time, you'll be hearing the same things about Arch. That the leadership skills are starting to really take over. And that you can tell he feels comfortable inside himself as the guy on offense, that those two things aren't conflicting with each other, I think really speaks to the comfort at the quarterback position where it doesn't feel like one's trying to undermine the other or that there's a real battle taking place. Everybody seems to know their role and they're trying to expand that role, but none of it's meeting head on in a way that's problematic, which is why it's probably been a lot quieter around the quarterback position this spring than a lot of people might have guessed two, three months ago. These guys are working on their on their areas. They're kind of in the zone. They're grinding away. And that's pretty boring when hmm. you, you talk about surprises and camp standouts and things like that. They're doing everything that's expected of them, which leaves us talking about guys like Ryan Wingo and, and, and the newcomers. Uh, and things like that. Nothing wrong with making me think of the Empire Strikes Back on a Thursday. Do or do not, there is no try. Uh, we got a great chat in on Arch. Uh, a shout out to everybody who's jumping into the Specs chat. Already up over 200 folks in there. Let's hear from Specs because they got plenty for you too. You're needing Specs same day delivery can save the day with our Specs app or online shopping. From world-class wines to hard-to-find spirits and craft beers to gourmet foods, delicious snacks, and spectacular sweets. It's back. Cheers to savings. All right, Catch. Somebody sent us a uh, pretty good chat to start off here. Vivek with uh, Catch. Do you think Arch is ever going to ever going to fulfill the crazy expectations that exist for him being a number one recruit and so much pressure? God, it's a kind of a hard one to quantify to even know how to answer. Well, 
I, I, I think the expectations are that one day he'll be a first-round draft pick and maybe even the first overall pick in an NFL draft. That's kind of the expectations that uh, await him. Will he fulfill them? I give him a chance to do so. Um, I don't I don't know that you can guarantee it, but nobody seems to run away from the Arch Manning set of expectations that exist, that there's a sense that he's going to be that guy when he gets his time. It's just not his time fully as we sit here in the spring of 2024. I wonder how much different this camp looks. Probably pretty significant, Chad. Had Quinn Ewers gone pro and Arch Manning was the starting quarterback right now, my sense is that every practice would be about Arch, that every update would be about Arch, that if he had a mild day, we would overanalyze what does it mean that <laughs> he only completed 60% of his passes instead of 70 or 75%. What does it mean? I, I thought it was really interesting that last Friday – he almost had a pass picked off and nobody overreacted to it. Hmm. And I wondered what would it mean if he had almost gotten picked sixth in a practice where he's the starter and that happened one versus twos or one versus ones. He's weirdly working in a pretty quiet and resolved kind of area right now that he's allowed to make mistakes and there haven't been a lot of them, but we certainly haven't been reporting that Manning's been getting intercepted. We haven't been really doing that with any of the quarterbacks. They've been taking care of the football, but even if he had a pick here or there, and I'm sure he has, and they're maybe not always reported on, and, and, but then maybe sometimes his near pick sixes get reported on. And anytime you can get an Arch Manning note, you kind of report on it but nobody's overreacting yet when the deck clears itself and Quinn's gone and Arch is the guy, this is going to sound like a different show in 12 months. Yeah. I for, think that's for better right. or for worse, it's going right. to, it's going to sound differently. No, I think you're right. It'll be a different type of show. Vivek, thank you for that, uh, that chat and catch the phrase I always use for Sark and press conferences is effectively boring. I think it should be a goal of his to come out of those moments where you're not creating too much stir. You're a circus enough being Texas. Don't create more. Don't add on to it, as we've seen maybe a couple coaches do in this last little run. But the fact that these two quarterbacks are not causing extra stir, I don't know how much credit Sark gets for that, but this quarterback room right now feels effectively boring. And that is not a word I thought we would use to describe it, but I think it's a great description right now for what they're pulling off here. Uh, because it's not that it's bad. It, Cause if it was bad, that's all we talk about. Like you said, if it was a bad room, if there were picks, if balls were hitting the ground way too much, whatever it was, we would hear about it. And, uh, and we are not, uh, by the way, just a shout out to Alan for being the, being the like button guy, Alan, you've taken on that role. We appreciate it. We're going to start calling you uh, like button, Alan, or something. We'll give you a name. Uh, but yes, thank you for reminding folks to hit that like button. Uh, also, uh, Shook Ones, let us know what your super chat was yesterday that we missed. And uh, you don't even have to throw the money at us today unless you really want to again. And uh, we will try to get there uh, at some point today. All right. Uh, coming up here in just a minute, as I see our guy, our super guest, John Harris, has actually jumped in a little early. We are going to get to him talking some Houston Texans acquiring Mr. Diggs from Buffalo, but also talking about the draft a little bit and anything else we can think of. One of our of our favorite football guys is coming right up. Let me give you a quick reminder about AV consultations. This is the place that provided that badass 65-inch TV that the winner of the bracket contest is going to get. Good luck to those of you that are not me or Catch or really anybody at Orange Bloods, I don't think, has that kind of a bracket. Whoever's up at the top, Best of luck getting that 65-inch TV and the cool stuff from Rogue and the years uh, year of orange freeorangebloods.com. All that stuff is there. AV Consultations has been doing it since 1988. They can get that TV you've always wanted, that man cave you've always wanted, the movie room for your family that you've always thought about. Remember, let them handle every detail, the TV, all the cords, all the cables, all the speakers, the furniture, 
everything and they can do this. They can put TVs and screens maybe in places you didn't know it was possible. They can do that for you. If you're a super kitchen person and you need a screen in the kitchen that's badass, they can do that and so much more. 255-8678 or go to avconsultations.com. Obviously, Final Four coming up this weekend. WrestleMania is coming up this weekend and all kinds of stuff you might want. The Still about a month away from the draft, though. We're we're eking our way to right. the draft. Draft not quite there yet. Not quite uh, draft ready. But this next guy is definitely ready for the draft and all kinds of things. And the team that he patrols the sidelines for made some NFL news yesterday. Why don't we go ahead and bring in the man, the myth, the legend. It is John Harris, footballtakeover.com. He's the Texans sideline reporter. Mr. Harris, how are you? I'm better than I was 36 hours ago. I'll tell you that. I did not. I mean, I'm like, I, you, I, 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 I echo those comments, comments, John. I did not. You know, it's funny. I, I, I shouldn't say I didn't see this coming. I just didn't see Diggs being that guy. You had seen some things with restructured contracts lately, and you thought, okay, maybe that, that means something. You wouldn't clear cap space now if they weren't trying to do something. And I'm talking not 30 minutes beforehand. I've talk, been talking to Mark Vandermeer about it. I thought, Ayuk, Brandon Ayuk, that's got to be it, right? It's got to be Ayuk. I mean, what what else could it be? And about a half hour later, we realized it's, no, it's Stephon Diggs. Like, wait, what? We just <laughs> traded for Stephon Diggs. Holy cow. And I happened to be walking out of the building yesterday, and Brevin Jordan, our tight end, was coming in from a workout. And he just saw me. He was like, Diggs? Are you kidding me? Like these guys that were in the building yesterday. I mean, it was they'll, they'll remember where they were too, just like just like I will. I mean, it was just this sh- kind of shocking moment of, oh my god, our receiving core is Nico Collins, Tank Dell, and Stephon Diggs to start. Uh, wow. Um, not to mention Joe Mixon being with the offense. Uh, Dalton Schultz coming back to the offense. <laughs> oh yeah, number seven throwing the ball is pretty good too. And you start reading what people are writing about. Oh, are you know, are the Texans the number two team behind Kansas City now? Are they better than Baltimore? Um, are they clearly the best in the AFC South by far? You read what people are saying in Tennessee and Jacksonville, and you go, Oh my gosh, like they saw that news and just it you know, stunned them, but in a worse way, because now they realize, oh God, we gotta face that offense. So it's kind of nice to be on that side of it for once because from 2020 to 20, you know, January 8th of 2023. That's when we played the Colts to end the 2022 season. And we went up there and had two miraculous fourth down plays. We got a win. Everybody thought that was the, the worst thing we could have done. We lost the number one pick. We we're losing out on Bryce Young. And when you look back, it might have been the best thing to ever happen to this organization because we lost that game. A few weeks later, D'Amico Ryans was added as, added as head coach to Nick Casario. And that popped the top for everything to happen from that point forward. Um, and it's been really fun to be a part of it and just to see it all happen um, and be in the building when that was announced was just, I mean, everybody was like, what? Holy cow. So uh, it's going to be interesting to to see Diggs here and could put it together like, yo, he's going to be putting on a Texans jersey. He is going to be catching passes from C.J. Stroud. How close are we to getting to a Super Bowl? Are we in that conversation now? Uh, that's a that's an odd spot to be after three years of just taking just hit after hit after hit. Hey, John, you got to go on radio at six o'clock tonight and talk about all this dysfunction. Great. <laughs> Love it. Let, let's do it. I just didn't I, I knew we'd get to the other side. I just didn't know we'd get to the other side. And then this would be what. You know, we'd have, you know, there and. I'm here for it. Let's go. I'm here for it. Let's see what happens now. So now, now I'd like to think at 42 and 59 that y'all's two universities might be able to provide, maybe not, you know, A&M just yet, but maybe, I mean, there's a lot of talk here about Edge Cooper being the guy that people want at 42. I'm, I love Edge Cooper. I just feel like we already have him and Christian Harris, but Devondre Sweat is definitely in play. I think they're, the, the Texans have got to draft a Longhorn, I would imagine. A Longhorn or an Aggie. They got out of this draft with no Longhorns and no Aggies. Like, it'll be kind of a shock because they have players at positions I think could still really fit, probably starting with Sweat. 
maybe, you know, Edge Cooper um, for for the Texans. But either way, they're going to add somebody that it's going to be best player available. I do think there are some positions that are still not totally tightened up, you know, defensive tackle and corner. But I still feel like at 42 and 59 in the second round, they can kind of go wherever they want, and you'll still feel like they've got a really good opportunity to bring in a young player um, that can add to the core of this team, which they still need to continue to build. The young core has been built, but now they can need to continue to do it. John, I felt like I had an evolution of thoughts yesterday when I heard about the Stefan Diggs trade. The first one, I was in my car, and Chad told me about it. And he was like, mm-hmm. hey, just so you know, the Texans got Stefan Diggs. And I just – it just took a second. It was like, wait, what? Yep. Mm-hmm. They got Stefan Diggs – and nothing else kind of mattered. I just was like, that seems pretty badass. Yeah. And then and then the second phase of the evolution was, well, he was pretty awesome at the beginning of the year and then wasn't awesome down the stretch. Yep. I wonder what version of Stefan Diggs that they're getting. And then the third piece of the evolution was, wait a minute, they're not giving up anything from this year's draft hall. It's next year. It's at number two next year. And I just felt like, well – that does that feels very low risk to some degree. It's not no risk. You don't ever right. want to give up a two just for fun, but all things <laughs> being considered, it didn't feel like a massive deal. What was your reaction to those reactions? What what version of Stefan Diggs do the Texans think they're getting? Is he definitely gonna be their number one, or does that stuff not matter because they already have such a talented wide receiver group? And catch I'll hand that last one first. I don't think it really matters. I think all three of their their top guys, Nico Tank and and Diggs, I think they're all guys that can play every spot, um, uh, you know, across the lineup. And so I think, uh, you know, the word game plan offense got to be a bad word around here because you know Bill O'Brien preached about our game plan offense, but basically he was saying that because the offense sucked, um, that never was any good. <laughs> this is going to be a game plan offense in the fact that they can take the chess pieces now and say, okay, you want to play this coverage? Well, we're going to put Tank and Diggs on this side and let Nico work one-on-one on the backside. Well, now we're going to put Tank outside, let him go one-on-one, and we're going to move, you know, Diggs in motion over here. Well, now we're going to have Diggs over here because, you know, he likes this matchup against this guy. I just think that you're right, Catch. There, there's no such thing as a no-risk maneuver. There's no, no, there's none. But this is as close as you can get. You didn't give up anything in this draft. Can You know, what's the worst thing that could, you know, happen – well, he comes in and he affects the lo- infects the locker room with you know his diva ness or whatever you want to call it. And I I come back to this and I and my buddy uh, the Sal Capaccio the the sideline reporter for the Bills and he he used to tell me you know a lot of that stuff about Diggs is overblown. He's like, yeah, look, he wants the football, especially when things aren't going well, because he believes in himself. Like, hey, get me the ball, I'll make things right for all of us. And he said that's you know that's a that was a, a major part of it. Now. Is there, is there more to it behind the scenes? You know, we're about to find out. But I also go back to this point. And I always think of Mike Tomlin in this way. I think D'Amico Ryans is a lot like Mike Tomlin. I think players play for Mike Tomlin, and they don't want to let him down. And they they try to suppress maybe some of their, their, their inner thoughts that maybe aren't always about football and all that. You know, how did Mike Tomlin get the most out of Antonio Brown? But then Antonio Brown went elsewhere and it was all his drama. Mike Tomlin found a way. He's always done that in Pittsburgh. He's so he's received so well. I think D'Amico Ryans has that kind of gravitas in it because he was also a player. So what he makes up for not having the coaching experience, he can make up for being a player. So when you think about D'Amico Ryans, if he if he is the leader of men that we think he is, and we think he's a great leader of men, then I don't think he's gonna allow Diggs to come in and infect that locker room with, hey, look at me stuff. I don't think he's gonna do that. So I think that, that's definitely a challenge for D'Amico. Um, and obviously he has to, you know, sign off on it. And he and Nick sitting now going, hey, how does this work? Is this something we want to be able to do? Do we think this is going to be a problem? Um, and I imagine that D'Amico Ryan is going to be a, play a huge role in it, obviously being a head coach, but just making sure that the communication is there with Diggs to make sure that, hey, we're all in this together. And I get a feeling, this is me, guy's now 30, 31 years old, and he's 30. He's made his money. And what's missing? The rings. He's gotten a two AFC champion or two championship games. One in the NFC with the Vikings. One in the, uh, with the Bills in the AFC. It's about winning a ring at this point and cementing a legacy. And how do you cement the legacy? You go win a Super Bowl. You get a ring. You got all the cash you need. Away you go. 
and to do it in a place where it's never been done before. So if you think about it from Diggs, and I know he was traded here, but if you think about it from Diggs' perspective, he's sitting there going, hey, wait a second, they never gone to the AFC Championship game? Nope. Never, so obviously never been to the Super Bowl, never won a Super Bowl. Diggs comes in, you go to the AFC Championship game, you go to the Super Bowl, you win a Super Bowl, those things happen. Maybe you weren't the only reason it happened, but now you become a big reason for those things happening. Man, you cement the legacy. You become a freaking hero in this town forever if you're able to do that. Forever if you're able to do that. I mean, uh, my God, Charlie Morton, a pitcher for the Astros that nobody had ever known or heard of, balled out in the World Series in 2017. He wasn't a great pitcher. He didn't make a ton of money. Charlie Morton walks into a bar here in Houston, and I swear to God, he'll never pay for another drink again. Never. Diggs gets this team, helps get this team to an AFC championship, get them to a Super Bowl, win a Super Bowl. Well, that's a huge feather in his cap, man. Huge. So you take all that into account. Yeah, it's lower risk. I hope it's lower risk. You hope he doesn't infect the locker room, but you feel like you've got a good locker room as it is, and you feel like D'Amico Ryan's. Can handle. He's been around, guy. He played in the league. He knows how guys and receivers. He knows how they tick. He knows how to get through to them. And obviously, you've got, you know, number seven in C.J. Stroud. Who knows Diggs? Um, and Tank looks up to Diggs. You know, all those things kind of play a role. So I think Diggs is going to come in here, especially year one. You know, and look, if the wheels come off after a couple of years, but we've gone to a Super Bowl, won a Super Bowl. Okay, great. That, that, that's fantastic. We'll shake hands and we'll move on. We've done that with receivers before, sometimes before their prime was over. Um, and it still turned out okay eventually. So we'll see how that part of it goes. But just to see an offense that's going to roll out Diggs, Nico, and Tank, C.J. Stroud, Joe Mixon, Dalton Schultz, that's pretty freaking scary for teams to have to face. And I like that feeling finally of looking across at a defense going, Oh, my God, I fear what they have as opposed to, hey, suckers, you guys are going to fear us today. And every time you face us, you're going to fear us. And that's kind of fun to have. Yeah, and as Catch mentioned, doesn't affect the draft hall this year, which does include two second-round picks like John was referencing. John, you made a reference to Tavondre Sweat in the second round. Let's talk about Longhorns in the first round. Let's say best-case scenario, Murphy and the two receivers go in the first Give me some some team matchups that you like. I've seen mock drafts with Murphy to a couple different teams. I've seen the Bills getting both receivers, depending on the mock you're looking at. Yep. The, the Chiefs worthy thing is out there. Give me some, like, where do you think the fits could be if those three go in the first? Well, I like Murphy, the Rams. I mean, I think it's a logical spot for, you know, with Aaron Donald moving on. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm literally just looking at the Rams roster right now as I'm doing working on my draft guide. I've gotten to the, the Rams section where I'm doing their draft team needs. And I just wrote key losses, Aaron Donald. And I just, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I love watching that guy. I love seeing him up close. Um, I saw him at the Senior Bowl in 14. And uh, <laughs> I think I've told the story before. I'll tell real quick on Aaron Donald. I was at the 2014. You guys will chuckle because of who this is. I'm at the Senior Bowl for the first time in 2014. And I'm standing near the fence watching O-line, D-line. So I'm not seven, ten yards away from this. And I look up and I see former Baylor head coach Art Bryles. And I've known Art a little bit and got to know him over the years. I see him and I kind of, you know, pull up next to him. <clears throat> and it was just the year that Surreal Richardson was in that senior bowl. And so I'm kind of, hey, coach, tell me about your guy. And he's like, oh, you know, you know, Art. Oh, John, listen. That guy's he's a first rounder all the way. He's a stud, stud human being, like all the and I swear to God, the words are coming out of his mouth. And I watch Aaron Donald absolutely turn Cheryl Richardson around like he's an outhouse door. I mean, just I worked him. I was like, whoa. And I didn't say anything because coach was kind of looking at me, kind of watching at the same time. So I didn't know if he saw it. But I remember thinking, man, either. Either coach is not quite sure what he's got and those guys aren't very good, or that dude 97 is the best I've ever seen. And it turned out that both things were true. Um, but the Rams need, obviously, um, some interior players. I mean, Kobe Turner was great for them, but I still think they, they don't have a ton of depth, and I think they need a player. And I think Murphy would be a great, great fit. They've answered a lot of offensive line 
um, situations they've got, the interior offensive line, and when I got Jonah Jackson. So I think the Rams would be a great spot for Byron Murphy. The Bills make a lot of sense. The, I, I feel like the Bills are going to end up with a, with a longhorn receiver. Um, and now with Diggs being being gone, I, I man, there could be two longhorns. They could end up taking one of those two and then take Whittington later in the draft. I mean, mm. they now need receivers all over the place. So uh, I think – and they already knew they were needing receiver, depending – regardless of what happened with Diggs. Now they need one. So I, I could absolutely think – and I absolutely think the Bills uh, are a great spot. The Chiefs – there's been a lot of talk about, hey, let's get that speed guy. But they went and got Hollywood Brown. So I don't know if the Chiefs make a lot of sense. But here's what I did in my first mock draft. I backed off um, on my second mock draft because um, I gave – then I ended up giving them, I think, Xavier Worthy. Worthy. But when the Chiefs started the offseason, they only had one defensive lineman that was signed under contract. I gave them to Vondre Sweat. And it made a lot of sense in my mind. Like, you know, Chris Jones plays opposite Devondre Sweat. Sweat doesn't have to play, you know, 30, 35 plays. You know, he can play 45 to 50% of the snaps. You know, with Jones, get off the field on rundowns. You know, they bring in Mike Pennell and Derek Nottie later. Oh, boy, that would be a really good fit. And then I kind of backed off it because I was like, okay, well, they need a receiver. So I gave him a receiver. And then a few days later, they ended up going out and getting Hollywood Brown. So, Maybe they're maybe back to Tavondre Sweat with the Chiefs. That might not be a bad spot. I would hate the hell out of it um, because I would hate us having to go up and try and block that monster. Um, but I feel like Murphy to the Rams feels like a really like strong fit. There are some teams that need defensive tackle, like the Vikings. I think the Vikings need defensive tackle pretty badly. But the Vikings have to package 11 and 23 to go get a quarterback because if they're relying on Sam Donald to be the quarterback – then that's that's trouble city. So the Vikings got to package both of those. In one of the in one of the uh, mocks I did, I ended up having all the quarterbacks off because I did one without any trades. So the Vikings get there at eleven. The four quarterbacks are off the board, and I'm not putting Bo Nix to the Vikings, even though they need a quarterback. And I said I got to give him a deal. so I gave him Byron Murphy. So the Vikings made a lot of sense, but. You know, I don't know how the Vikings are going to sit there at 11 and get one of those four quarterbacks. They're going to have to move, and they're going to have to use, I would imagine, pick 23 to do it. But the Vikings need defensive tackles as well. So, um, And I think that would be a good spot for him um, because of his scheme versatility. He can play in a number of different fronts and different things that he can do. So, you know, Rams and Vikings, I think, would be tremendous spots. I mean, how many teams need a receiver? I mean, every team that needs a receiver, you can just pencil in one of the two, um, one of the two uh, Texas receivers. I think Mitchell will be the one that's kind of, you know, interesting because maybe teams want a little bit more size, a little bit more completeness from that perspective. Maybe they're scared by Xavier Worthy, but you know, my comp for Xavier Worthy is Tank Dell. And Tank's a pretty tough dude, and he handled it. He got rolled up on. I mean, anybody, you know, could have been 215 pounds as opposed to 165, and a guy's leg would have broke compared, you know, with what happened with Tank. But would you not want Tank Dell on your roster? Heck, yeah, you'd want Tank Dell on your roster. So – I think the Texas receivers, the Bills make a lot of sense. Chiefs make some sense. Um, and wouldn't you be surprised? This is kind of a different team, but I know they brought back Mike Evans. But I think the Tampa Bay Buccaneers wouldn't be, wouldn't be surprising um, for one of those receivers. To, to put somebody – I know Trey Palmer has done some good things, but you know, Chris Godwin's getting up there in age. I think Worthy and, and Mitchell are upgrades from you know what they've got, Trey Palmer and some of the other guys. I even think at this point they're probably better weapons than Godwin is. I think Godwin's kind of maybe reached the end of his rope. So maybe the Buccaneers, maybe that's a spot uh, for them at that point. Worst case, this is the, and you never know how these things go, but worst case, the Panthers, the first pick in the second round will take whichever one of those two Carolina Panthers, or uh, whichever the Texas Longhorns receivers fall to them at 33. They've got to have weapons. They've got to. They fortified inside. They got to get weapons. So the Panthers will absolutely, that's the, the last spot where, I mean, if it goes beyond that, then something's going on that we don't know about. And I, I don't, I, you know, you guys know better than I do about that. Then there's something going on. But the last spot I would think where absolutely no doubt they'll both be off the board would be the Panthers at 33. John, you touched on something that I wanted to get into just about the draft in general. It feels like every year, not that we're being told, but, Whenever we see mock drafts and it turns into kind of trade city, the second pick, the third pick, teams are moving up and around. It always feels like that kind of doesn't unfold, that we expect craziness. And then it's 
kind of chalk. There aren't a lot of trades. It's kind of a normal draft. Do you think this I, – I look at the teams that are currently in the top five, and I'm like, okay, well, they could use a top five pick. They could use a quarterback. They they could use a lot of things. They're in the top five for a reason. Yep. Do we think that there's going to be movement, that those – those teams are in kind of the catbird seat because of where they're drafted and that they could come away with a little bit of a haul that they can't turn away? Or do you think they end up staying pat and taking the quarterbacks and they've got their guys? Well, it's a great question. I was just actually just on this morning with Paul Allen from the Vikings, and he was asking me about that. And they're sitting at 11 and, they, and, and 23. They know they need quarterback. And to me, it breaks down. There's top tier four, which have been talked about. <laughs> Uh, Caleb and Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and J.J. McCarthy, those four. And I think those four are going in the top six picks. You got to think that, to your point, Catch, there's going to – it seems logical that the top four teams would take quarterbacks. But you know the, the fourth team, the Arizona Cardinals aren't taking a quarterback. But the Cardinals are willing to move. To me, the Cardinals – and I, I wrote this in my last mock draft when I, when I did trades. I think the Cardinals can do exactly what they did last year. The Cardinals were sitting at three last year. We were sitting at 12. We traded with them, so they moved down to 12, picked up a bunch of picks. Then they traded back up to six and went and got the offensive lineman they liked in Paris Johnson. I think they can do the same thing. They're sitting at four. You've got the Raiders that you could argue need quarterback. You've got the Vikings that need quarterback. The Broncos need quarterback. And it's always nice when you have two from the same division. Let them fight it out. And so the Cardinals are sitting there saying, okay, we're sitting at four spot. We saw we've seen the three teams take quarterbacks. Number four is left. JJ it's JJ McCarthy. Or you could sit there at 11, 12, and 13 and take Bo Nix, Michael Penix. And maybe they feel good about that. Maybe. You want to get that guy, JJ McCarthy. Come on. Let's go. So the Cardinals sit there and trade because they've got their quarterback. They trade down to 11, 12, 13, pick up a bunch of draft capital, move back up to seven, eight. Get Marvin Harrison Jr., get Malik Neighbors, get Roma Dunze, get one of the three receivers. They're going to be sitting in a perfect spot. I feel like the Cardinals are in a perfect spot to reset their organization like we did uh, last year. They've got multiple they got multiple picks. They can move up and down the board. They did it last year. It worked really well for them. I think they can do it again this year and really set themselves up, understanding that Kyler Murray isn't C.J. Stroud. But I'll tell you, if Kyler Murray is right, He's going to give them an opportunity. I thought he looked much better last year in that offense than he than he did in Cliffs. So I think Kyler Murray, albeit not a top three quarterback in the league, but really good and very explosive and athletic, combined with more pieces. Holy cow! The Cardinals start start being pretty exciting because of what they can do. So the Cardinals, to me, kind of hold the key. But I think even before that, the Patriots hold the key because the Patriots have to make the decision. I mean, two quarterbacks off the board. We'll see who they are. More than likely, Caleb at one, and then probably Jalen Daniels at two. Either way, the Patriots have to make a decision. Is our guy on the board at that point? We like Daniels. Daniels just went to the commanders. Do we like Drake May the same way? Do we like J.J. McCarthy the same way? Can we live without a quarterback maybe for a while? Can we trade into the back end of the first round and maybe get a Bo Nix and a Michael Penix to learn behind Jacoby Brissett? So I think picks three and four catch are going to really set the draft for what it's going to be. Is it going to be one of those crazy nights like we had last year where all of a sudden, holy cow, the Texans are now at two and three and reset our whole organization? Or are the Patriots just going to go, you know what, we're going to take the third quarterback. The Cardinals are like, eh, you know what, we can't really find a trade partner. We're just going to take Marvin Harrison Jr., and then all of a sudden you get the Harbaugh, Joe Hortitz, and the Chargers, and it's crazy town because you never know what Harbaugh's going to do. <laughs> so I think, you know, I think crazy town is going to happen with Harbaugh, um, you know, at, at five. So I do think that quarterbacks go off the board at least one, two, three, and I do think four because I think the Cardinals will move out of there. They're going to get a sweet deal. They'll take it. They'll move out of there. Then they'll move back up and go get one of the receivers and then bank all that draft capital and get a bunch of first and second round picks for this year, next year, et cetera. So even though the Cardinals, I don't want to say they stunk. That was a that was a decent team last year. I don't think people realize how good they actually were. They just didn't win a lot of games, but they showed a lot of promise under Jonathan Gannon. You now add Marvin Harrison Jr., another pick later in the first round, two early picks in the second round. 
they could turn that thing around in a hurry. I think they're the key, but before them, I think we'll see what the Patriots do. That's going to kind of change everything for the whole night. All right, John, I just got one more, and I want you to re- respond to some of our chats here. Speaking of crazy town, some of our viewers and listeners think you're in crazy town now. It says wild that they're talking about the Super Bowl, LOL. Someone no, else no, says, well, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Someone else. I didn't say, I didn't say I said that. I said national analysts are saying that. Right. They're talking about the Texans being in the Super Bowl conversation. And, you know, Blake, the Texans Super Bowl don't belong in the same sense. Well, I guess they need to do the Cowboys at this point. So, you know, it's just kind of the way it is. I mean, I, I will never sit here and say we're going to the Super Bowl. Never. I don't care if we won four in a row. I'll never sit here and tell you that we're going to the Super Bowl. But the fact of the matter is people that cover this sport across the nation – in every form that there is in media are talking about us being in Super Bowl conversation. Take that for what it is. I'm not sitting here and telling you this is a Super Bowl team. I mean, I'd rather I be the Texans and the Cowboys even... right now. Well, as a Cowboys fan, I'm just saying that. And and here's the thing, I think, John, this this chat, they're acting like Diggs is going to be some incredible game changer and there's an LOL behind it. There's been a, there's just a difference of opinion about certain people are looking at Diggs as a 30-year-old, mm-hmm. washed up guy with a bad attitude. And then there's some people like me that heard that news yesterday as a Cowboys fan and went, oh, hell. They yeah. a team that I respected that got better anyway just got even better. Like I saw it on the high end, but there are some people that are seeing it differently uh, in terms of what he is. Let me let me give you a great example of this. And, and when the Cowboys, when we made the trade last year with the Cowboys sending Brandon Cooks to Dallas, we in the building and Texas fans were kind of like, yeah, right, okay, look what Dallas is getting. They're getting a shell of what Brandon Cooks was and then you see brandon cooks early in the season and we're all sitting here in houston going see told you doesn't have anymore nothing then you're watching monday night game and it's like all right well yeah okay he caught a touchdown pass okay and then you see the next game and it's like well he caught another six seven the point is this is stefan Diggs what he was four years ago probably not no but the risk involved to go get Stephon Diggs to see where he is and what he can bring to this offense is really low. So take the risk, take that calculated risk and go see what's going to end up happening. Look, we, we in Houston have been talking about Calvin Ridley going to Tennessee and Tennessee fans are like, yes, we got our number one wide receiver. And we're looking at it going, man, Calvin Ridley, like he doesn't scare, he doesn't scare anybody. So at that point, if if Diggs ends up being – look, Diggs caught 106 passes last year, okay? So let's say he has a bad year and he catches 75%. Let's say he catches 75 passes for 900 yards and seven touchdowns. Guess what you gave up to get 75 catches, 900 yards, and five, six touchdowns? You gave up a second rounder that you – in next year's draft. You didn't give up anything in this year's draft. So what's the risk? What's the risk? So take the risk. John, I got to admit, as a Cowboys yeah. as a Cowboys fan, I'm used to the Cowboys giving up two first-round draft picks <laughs> for wide receivers. So <laughs> I'm still a little confused by this whole, wait a minute, it's a second-round pick next year. How does that happen? I, I thought it was a one this year uh, and a one next. Hey, John, real quick before we let you go, I got to ask you about Jatavian Sanders. He's had the weirdest damn offseason – Yep. Then I think any of us would have ever expected that when he entered the draft, the thought was, well, look, Brock Bowers is going to be the first tight end. And then Sanders has a chance to definitely be the second. And then how well will he work out? Could he sneak into the first? Is he definitely a second round pick? And then the workout started and it just doesn't feel like anything's gone well for him. How do you view where he is what he's looking at, like what what's 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 John Harris's breakdown of Jatavion Sanders after all of the draft, the combine, and his senior day? Yeah, you know it's a it's a great question, Catch. I, I, I've thought a lot about like you know people start talking about tight ends. It's interesting because when Dalton Schultz resigned with us, 
last year, you know, I'm sure a guy that Cowboys fans thought was dead and couldn't do any more, and yet he was a huge fixture in our passing game. But, you know, whatever. Um, so with Dalton Schultz signed, I was like, okay, well, I don't think we're really in a tight end market. Uh, if we're in a tight end market, we're, we're looking for a, a, an inline Y that can, you know, beat people up at the point of attack, you know, looking at some of those bigger big Big Ten tight ends. You know, a guy like Sanders really kind of doesn't make any sense because we kind of have guys like that. So, okay, well then where does where does Sanders kind of fit? And I think that's the that's the that's the question mark is where where does he fit? Um, is he a is he a dynamic pass catcher? I think he could be. I think he very well could be. So I I think that some team is going to end up taking him a little bit. I don't want to say on spec, but they're going to be taking him, thinking, okay, can this guy be? You know, can he be? You know, I don't want to say it sounds weird, but is he a poor man's version of Dalton Kincaid? You know, could he be that? You know, could he end up being like, you know, a mix between Kincaid, Logan Thomas? You know, just a pass catcher that you know basically is a receiver for you. Can he can he run some of the H back stuff? You know, could he step the fullback at times? You know, kind of give him a little bit more versatility. You know, it's just been kind of odd. The tight ends, this tight end group, it's like, well, it's basically Brock Bowers, and then after that, it's kind of a. I mean, I, I mean, it's the nicest way. It's kind of a crapshoot, really. There's just, it's just one of those years where it's not a great tight end group. You know, last year you had Laporta, um, you had Dalton Kincaid, you had a few others, Michael Mayer. You had three tight ends going to top 37, I think, last year. You had a really good tight end group. This group just, other than Bowers, and there's some people that don't even look at Bowers as a tight end. You know, because he does a lot of wide receiver, he even does stuff in the backfield. He's an eight, you know, he's kind of a he's kind of a tight end adjacent almost, but he gets thrown in that tight end category um, because that's the position title he was given at Georgia. But he's even really not even that. And I think maybe that's where Sanders is. I think Sanders is kind of he's kind of tight end adjacent. Now he's a willing blocker. He's not a he's not a great blocker, but he put his hand in the dirt and he'll get after it a little bit. I don't think he's a great blocker, but then again. I don't know that I've seen a college tight end block anybody worth a damn in the last, I don't know how many years. I was right down, well, willing blocker, but I just don't see anybody really blocking at the point of attack where I go, okay, that's that's that guy's calling card. So I don't rely too much on that. So can he get separation? Can he catch the ball? I think there's going to be some team that says, you know what, we do have a need. But as I go through this, I don't see a lot of teams that really have a need for a tight end kind of at the top of their priority list except for a few that might look at, you know, the New York Jets, number 10. That makes a lot of sense for Brock Bowers. After that, it's like what teams you start making a case for. Well, this team could use a tight end, but, oh, my God, they've got to fix the offensive line. Or they need a corner. Oh, my God, they need a corner. So I think that's kind of where Sanders is getting caught in. I don't know that, you know, the, the offseason has been tremendous for him. And I think combined with teams that may not have a distinct tight end need, you put that together, and it may push Sanders on into the third round. But at this point, it becomes – you know, look, if you're not going to be a first-rounder, at that point, two through seven, I know you want to see your name and get it off the – get it off your, your – like, okay, I'm going to such and such place. It's great. It's about the fit. Where is he going to fit? What's the best fit? Where is he going to have the best opportunity? So if that happens, you know, he goes all the way in the fourth round, but his opportunity ends up being – you know, somewhere where he can make an impact. Like Darnell Washington last year is a great example. The Steelers had one tight end. That was it. Washington went all the way in the third round. You're like, oh, my God, he fell all the way in the third round. But because he fell in the third round, he got the Steelers, and he had an opportunity to play right away with the Steelers because all they had was Pat Fryer. And that's what you want to have if you're Sanders at this point. Hmm. Great stuff as always. I'm good, Catch. Me too. I'm just thinking about Jatavian Sanders in the third round and – Orange Bloods is going to lose its mind if that happens, and it <laughs> might very well happen. I don't think anybody's prepared for the fact that he left early, only to go in the third round. But you know, when you lift like two time, two two reps of two twenty five, okay, nine, I think is what it was. But whatever the case may be, it wasn't great. Uh, John, really appreciate it, my man. Thank you on short notice for coming on and talking about Diggs and the Texans and the draft. Uh, have Absolutely. a good rest of the day. Absolutely, boys. Appreciate you having me, and uh, much love to all the Cowboys fans. Look, I don't hate the Cowboys. <laughs> I don't hate the Cowboys. I don't. I don't hate the Cowboys. I want that known, Blake and Vivek and whoever else was commenting. Yeah. I don't hate the Cowboys. We'll see you this year up in Arlington, though. That'll be fun. It'll be Diggs v. Diggs. That'll be a good one.
That will be good. And for the record, John, I was one of those Cowboys fans whose heart was broken that they, uh, that we lost Dalton Schultz. I miss him every day. Every, <laughs> every catch I see him make with the Texans, it makes me sad. Well, the so thing, I, the I, thing is, I I'm a that. Cowboys fan, and I hate the Cowboys. It's a very self-deprecating <laughs> like, existence yeah. that we live. So, Hey, Catch, I worked for the Texans for three years, and I probably hated the Texans for three years for everything that was going on. So it's <laughs> – it's okay. It's a it's a love hate relationship we have with our teams. It's just mine signs my paycheck, so I've got to be really really nice to make sure I get my paycheck. That's you know what hate, I'm saying. hate over here, but I do know what you're saying. John, have a great rest of the week, my man. All right, boys. See y'all. Thanks, John. John Harris, footballtakeover.com. If you have not checked it out, there's a lot of good stuff going on over Now's there. Now's the time to sign up. It's a good time to go read the mock drafts and to get yep. involved. And I'm again, I'm with Tom G. I I hated it. And I went to that Texan Steelers game last year in Houston and I watched Dalton Schultz make catches and I just oh just broke my heart when the Cowboys lost him. Uh catch, we did get the super chat from Shook Ones from yesterday. We did miss this one. Shook Ones, thank you for that money yesterday. Uh it's a buy or sell. Says speaking strictly college careers, given a chance to swap. Catch, you'd take Derek Johnson without thinking. Chad, you'd stick with that win. Boy, that's interesting. The answer is probably yes, I would think, for both. I think it's a buy. I, 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 I would probably buy that. I don't know why you would swap. For Texas, I don't know why you'd swap there. And from the AM perspective, Dat Win, I think, is still the leading tackler all time. He's just and as beloved as they get. So as, as beloved as they get, but also an absolute badass on that yeah. defense. It's not like the man was just some kind of a mascot for the team. He was a machine. So I'm gonna leave both of those guys in That's there. That's a mascot that is I mean, no wor words that have never been no. said out loud. No, that has never been talked about. I'm gonna leave both guys in their uh, in their normal uniforms, but uh, if you could have both, I think both sides would de definitely take both. If I could, I think uh, the intro, here's what I'm gonna do, Shook. I'm gonna think of the trade tomorrow on the show, and Chad, I want you to think about this too. Okay, I'll come up with a trade that I would make to give Derek Johnson to the Aggies. I'll tell you what I would need in return. Okay, and then we got to do this. I, these two guys didn't play at the same time. So when if I'm doing draft capital and trade stuff, I can do it from anywhere, anytime? It's got to be, look, I, look. I think it's like this. Both Derek Johnson and Dat Wynn are on the all-time Longhorn and Aggie teams, respectively. Yes. I need to come up with a trade all-time. All-time. So not from like 2001 through 2004. Okay. I've got to come up with a trade that would make sense. Okay. I'm curious what it would take to get that win off of your team in the name of making the all-time Aggies team better. Got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. I will do some research. For the name Earl Campbell's coming to mind initially. Uh, I, if we're going all time. <laughs> I thought you might go Ricky. It was like, hey, why not? If hey, you I went that. Here's what it's going to cost. Hey, I went right to one of those statues. You kind of knew that's maybe where I would go. Shook ones, thank you for that. We'll get to that discussion tomorrow. I like, uh, I do like that one. Uh, also, before we get out of here and get the little buy or sell going on, something else I like is Hayes City Store. Been dreaming about it since the last time I went because that's what it's all about. It's one of the best meals you're ever going to have right out there in the beautiful hill country. They're out in Driftwood, the beautiful shade trees. You see the tree and the emblem there, the beautiful shade trees out there. The weather right now is just perfect for Hayes City Store. Get on out there, whether you want the chicken fried steak, whether you want to try one of the great burgers. The pizza is something my daughter and, and our friends love. I've dug the pizza as well. There's just so many good things. I'm going chicken fried uh, pork chop next time I'm out there. My wife gets nothing right now but that grilled pork chop. She thinks it's the best pork chop she's ever had, and the desserts are some of the best, best you'll ever have as well. So get on out there. You cannot go wrong. You could close your eyes and just point at the menu, and you'll be good, uh, or you can just study up like I always do and go get you some out there at Hayes City Store. Tell Travis and Tamara and the crew that we said hello here at Orange Bloods Live. All right, Catch, you ready to buy or sell? I am. All right, first or second? I'll go second today. 
All righty. Let's get some, uh, we got some football nerdiness mixed in here, and I got some birthdays at the end. Let's start with nerdiness. Buy or sell number one. Last year, Quinn's rating was 158.6. This season, you think he'll hit 180 plus. So I think he's more in the 170 to 175 range. Okay. All right. So not quite to 180. Uh, let's go to the hardwood. Buy or sell number 180 would be the best regular season efficiency rating in the history of the program by almost 10 points. I think Colt was like at 172, 173 right. in 2008, and nobody else has gone beyond that, and really nobody else has been close. Gotcha. Uh, okay, there you go. There's a number to kind of keep in your head about what the, the best would be. Buy or sell number two, speaking of the best, women's final four. UConn takes down Caitlin, and then South Carolina beats UConn. So I'm going to go with Caitlin over UConn. And then South Carolina over Caitlin. Gotcha. Man, those ratings numbers still blowing my mind. Here's the one that got me more than any of the others, Catch. That game between uh, between Iowa and, U, uh, and LSU got a better rating, more people watched, than every regular season college football game last year except Michigan-Ohio State. <laughs> that's, I mean, it's that's amazing. Dumb. Like I said, it's amazing to think about what she's been able to create, uh, I don't know that I can think of anything ever quite like it. More people watch that than watch Texas and Alabama. More people watch that than – that's just – that's nuts. Uh, and uh, Final Four on Friday, of course, for the ladies and the guys on Saturday. Buy or sell number three catch. If a UT running back is going to have 200 carries this year, it's Baxter. Buy. Yeah, I think so. I think Baxter – ends up being the team leader in carries. And I think they'll get over 200, uh, you know, real quick. How many, we, at a minimum, we think Texas will play 14 games, 13 games, something like that. If you divide 200 by 14, that's 14, a little more than 14 carries a game. Mm -hmm. So as long as he stays healthy, I definitely think he's the 200 carry guy. No, I think you might be right. Historically, that is what Sark has ended up doing, that 2 to 250. There's a guy who gets those carries generally for a Sark team. All right, Catch, we're going superhero for the last couple on a birthday list. Buy or sell number four. Today is Robert Downey Jr.'s birthday. Iron Man is on your superhero movie, Mount Rushmore. I think it's got to be a buy because of Robert Downey Jr. That, you know, I don't think Iron Man – was a big deal. And so Robert Downey Jr. kind of made, to me anyway, look, I'm not a big comic book guy, but I know, you know, you start thinking about Superman and Batman and some of the real iconic, it doesn't matter who plays those characters. It's still Superman and Batman. I don't think Iron Man, when I was a kid, the Incredible Hulk was a much bigger deal mm -hmm. than Iron Man. And yet, I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who's 25 or younger that doesn't think that Iron Man is one of the true iconic superhero characters. And I think that's all RDJ, like his charisma, his acting chops, his ability to steal scenes has put Iron Man in the superhero Mount Rushmore. Yep, no doubt. And by the way, a special thanks uh, to one of the greats of all time, John Favreau, who's the reason RDJ got the job. He's the director of Iron Man, and he begged for it. He pushed for it. He got it, and he changed everything. Good after begging, that. John. Great. Sometimes begging doesn't pay. That time it did. Oh, the nerdy side of me could spend an hour telling you why I love John Favreau. My God. Uh, and finally, catch, let's go to the villain side. Buy or sell number five. It is also Heath Ledger's mm -hmm. birthday today. Rest in peace. His Joker is on your all-time movie villain Mount Rushmore, regardless of genre. I'm going to go by. I haven't even given it any thought, obviously. You just asked me the question. But it, it'd be hard-pressed for me to think of three villains better than that one. So I'm going to go by sight unseen. And I think in the end, I would work my way into a position where he's on the villain Mount Rushmore. Catch that movie will roll in and out of movie channels every once in a while. It'll just find its way on. And now, I mean, you know, 2024, I got, I got a couple of movie channels. When I see it, 
Sometimes I'll just record a big hunk of it. I'll record the rest of it. I'll watch a little bit of it. His scenes are just as magical as they were when I first saw him. I mean, it still grabs you the same way. I'm still as terrified as I was then. It It's so nuanced. His hand gestures, his mouth, everything about what he's doing as that character in every scene is just as good as it gets. It's, it's you know, that that's one of those where he wins the Oscar and all these years later, that wasn't an accident. There, no. there doesn't need to be a redo. It wasn't a pity deal. It is as deserved of an Academy Award as any we've ever seen. Yeah, the only pity is that he was 28 when he died. 28 years old. One of the best actors of our lifetime. 28. That's damn sad. All mm-hmm. right, buy or sell. Halfway done. What do you got, Catch? Buy or sell number one. You know who Travis Scott is, but you didn't know that he attended UTSA for a year. Uh, oh, that's definitely a buy. I'm aware of who Travis Scott is. I know he's a rapper, uh, but I did not know. No, I did not know that he was a roadrunner for a year. How about that? Then he just decided, you know, I think I'll do my own thing. I, I don't might. think it's the UTSA musical school to get there. And he was right. It just worked. It worked. Uh, buy or sell number two after listening to John Harris. You're convinced that Stefan Diggs is good for 1,000 yards in 2024. Ooh, it says 2025. It should say 2024. Gotcha. Okay, let me look at. I'm looking at the numbers from last year. Diggs had a le- little over 1100. Nico actually was almost to 1300. And you're saying it's a thousand? Yeah, a thousand. Yeah, I'll buy. I'll buy the thousand. I'm with John. I think it plugs in really well. I think it reslots Nico and Dell in really good ways. And if they scheme it right, I think Dalton Schultz is going to have a – Dalton had 59 catches last year, and I think he can at least find that again this year. So, yes, I think everybody benefits, but I do think it's a 1,000 for digs. I think he can get to a 1,000 and not even be great. I don't that know that he's going to be great, but I think he might get to a thousand well. anyway. Yeah, I think that I think that team may end up as a one A one B. I think we all may look at at Nico by the end of the year, or maybe it's Dell. But I think another one of those two guys feels like a one, maybe just as much as he does. Buy or sell number three. I just saw this on the front of ESPN.com. I think I may have even asked you this before, but okay. I'm going to go to it again. Buy or sell. Tyron Smith isn't a Hall of Famer for you as much as in the Hall of Very Good. Hmm. Um, that's got to be a buy. I mean, the, this is a weird Hall of Fame. Sometimes the Pro Football Hall of Fame puts folks in, and I'll go back and you go full resume, and you go, okay, all pros or Pro Bowl, how they, you know, how they judge it. But when you brought when the name popped up. I don't immediately think Canton. So I'm going to buy. Hall of Very Good, I don't quite think it's jacket level. Now he's not like the Aaron Donald of the offensive line position. No. he's Yeah, he's not. And you you gave me another buy or sell recently where it the other thing that pops in my head immediately, like there aren't many guys that I know get jackets where when you say their name, massive injuries is what I think of. Now, I'm not saying he's never played full season, but – you know, a lot of injury stuff has happened to him. It has kept him from putting together what I would consider, a, you know, an HOF resume. Buy or sell number four. This one hurts. You'd rather have D'Amico Ryans as head coach in the NFL than Mike McCarthy. <laughs> My God, that might be the easiest buy you've given me in a while. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is a by um, watching Mike McCarthy just kind of stare at situations and uh, and not figure it out. D'Amico feels like that you know the energy followed him in the building. You heard John Harris talk about how guys will play for him. Those stories are out there, not just from John Harris, who's on the sideline, but you can feel it. Again, I went and saw it live last year. I went with my wife and the in-laws, and I threw on the Steelers stuff, and I was a snarky-ass Cowboys fan that rooted against the Texans. But there's a magic energy around that team right now. Stroud's a badass. You can just feel that they're headed in the right direction. And D'Amico's the leader. Yes, catch. I would take him and I'd help McCarthy pack. I hate where we are as Cowboy fans. It's just, yeah. 
as I told, as I said to John, I, you know, it's very self-loathing at this point. There's just no way to get about it. And finally, buy or sell number five, the sport of basketball needs South Carolina and Caitlin Clark in the national championship game on Sunday. Uh, that's a buy. I mean, UConn, South Carolina would be good, but it wouldn't be transcendent good. It wouldn't be crossover good. Like my daughter can't name a South Carolina player. And she probably couldn't, she might know Paige Becker's name if I said it out loud. But my kid, every time Caitlin Clark is on the television, she stops doing whatever she's doing. She looks every single, every single time. Caitlin Clark has transcended. My kid's not a sports fan. Yeah, for the record, my kid does not really get into sports. She's usually on her phone doing something, and the game just happens to be on. But when Ka- she now recognizes her voice, when she hears her on a commercial, she'll look up. And then when the games are on, and I've started rewinding three pointers every once in a while. Hey, look at this one. And she'll be like, oh, wow. And she's listening to the announcers and she's getting into it. So yeah, the sport would benefit from it because the sport overall has, you know, both sides has some issues. But right now, man, it would be incredible if those two got together for the championship, which I think is on ESPN, if I'm not mistaken. So. And the men's final is on TBS. And I don't think I just lied. Go ahead. I just think it's funny that there's a movement of men who are convinced that Caitlin Clark is overrated. Wow. That's like, interesting. That's the hill they're going to die on. Going to die on that one. That's like those musical fans that'll tell you like the Beatles or Elvis is overrated. It's a weird group to get into where it's like, really? You can just tell me you don't like Elvis. There's lots of people that don't like Elvis. But when you go with, you know who's overrated? Elvis. Huh? Really? The whole Lenny McCarthy songwriting thing? (laughs) Overrated. What is that? What's that deal? So, yeah, that's one of those that's one of those key phrases. You can say overrated about just about anything. Uh, I feel like Caitlin Clark is properly rated right now. Just my just my feeling on it. Uh, And it will be fun to watch on Friday. That's a late one on Friday night. Catch people can like go out to dinner, come back and that game's going to be on. Um, That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Caitlin and Paige head to head. And, you know, Paige Becker's catch is so tired of hearing about Caitlin Clark. Oh my God. Gino said it the other day. Every time she hears one of those other names and the media asks her about one of these other names, it just pisses her off. Like she doesn't t- say it out loud, but it makes her mad. Hey, what about Juju? Hey, what about Caitlin? Hey, hey well, just so you know, Caitlin still probably go for 41. Like, hate away. It oh, hasn't yeah. worked so far. She will. The question is, can you get the can you get those big victories? Because the, the other lesson of basketball historically catch has been this. When you do what Caitlin Clark does, you don't win championships. Yeah. You don't because you're not on good a good enough team. The Oscar Robertsons and the Russell Westbrooks and the Pete Maraviches put up numbers. Luca for us Mavericks fans, all kinds of numbers. In- incredible. It doesn't mean you win titles, though. So let's see if she can pull it off. Because if she carries them to a title and beats that South Carolina team and a Geno team, Holy hell, that's legendary stuff. All right, let's wrap it up. All right, uh, remember to like, subscribe, and get your notifications to Orange Bloods Live. We do appreciate that. Coming up this afternoon at 4, it is another Modcast. I got a feeling like Anwar Richardson is uh, ready to roll for the war room tonight. Uh, he says he's got some good stuff. Find out a little, get a little preview maybe on uh, on the Modcast today. But also from the other guys, we got War Room coming tonight on orangebloods.com. If you don't know about it, let me throw you a code real quick in case you need to scan it later. It is War Room Night at orangebloods.com. Just about halfway through practices for the spring. And we are, what's today? 16 days till the spring game. Do I have that right? Yeah. 16 days away. Uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you for all your support. Thanks to specs for their support of the chat. We got 450 folks in the specs chat as we get ready to close the door. We'll be back tomorrow at high noon for a Friday show until then take care of yourselves. We are house divided. 